Well, hello everyone. This is a recording, well, especially for those who are on their own on Christmas Day and maybe having Christmas dinner on their own because I live on my own and when I'm eating on my own I like to listen to often a, a comedy programme or some music and I thought well people's plans haven't been able to be well we can't plan things at the moment can we and so there might be that we, we're finding ourselves on our own at Christmas uh, and feeling well I don't really feel like having my Christmas dinner on my own so this is meant to be for want of a better word a bit of an accompaniment to go with your Christmas dinner or you might listen to this in the afternoon so so you can hear a familiar voice I was thinking should I put pieces of music in and then I thought well I'm not really a DJ and if I put pieces of music in what happens is I might not be able to put it on YouTube so um, what I thought we'd do is we'd, we'd start with a little prayer and then I just thought I'd share some Christmassy stories with you and um, see where that goes and let it just be a time together uh, and if nothing else know that I'm just wanting to share my thoughts and my love with you at this Christmas time and so that you know that you're not on your own we're never on our own we're never on our own Emmanuel God is with us um, but sometimes we we can remember that when we know that other people are thinking about us as well so um, I always like to start with a prayer so begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit Amen Lord bless us you made a very special promise you said where two or three are gathered in my name I'm present amongst them well we're together in your name at this very special time of Christmas Emmanuel God with us so be the guest at our table for those of us who at different times eat on our own always be the guest with us at the meal bless the food that we eat help us to remember that we're we're never on our own and if at the moment we're feeling the pain of memories or the pain of the present moment or the pain of worrying about the future well bless us especially at this time Enfold us with your love, put your arm around us, comfort us so that we can know the full and true meaning of Christmas in our lives this year, Christmas 2020. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And if you're listening to this as you're having your Christmas dinner, then bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts, which we're about to receive from thy bounty through Christ our Lord. Amen. All being well, I'll be sitting down to Christmas dinner with my sister and my brother-in-law and my three nephews who are now getting very grown up. The twins will be 20 next year. I can't quite believe that because I still think I'm only 21. I'm just having a little cup of coffee. Um, I hope you are having something to celebrate as well. Um, and uh, this year I'm, I'm in charge. Uh, I'm in charge of uh, cooking the turkey again. Um, that was always uh, my mum's job. And I think at this time of year, I, I get a bit nostalgic and um, even to the last few years what used to happen when I became parish priest over in Pendle my mum and dad would come every year and they would come from the 23rd of December so it'd be yeah I'm recording this on the 22nd to make sure that I've done this for everyone so it will be the yeah the 23rd and they would come and stay with me until the day after new year so we used to have a good full amount of time together that must have that must have lasted over a good number of years and my mum 
would always cook the turkey on Christmas Eve and that always smelt wonderful. I can remember that smell from being little, the smell of the turkey. But when it, when they came to, to the presbytery, you would have the smell of the turkey and she would always put uh, sausages on and bacon on. My mum didn't like cooking. She did it because she had to. She was wonderful at many things, but she didn't like cooking. But she would always do all the cooking uh, that needed to be done. And so um, I would have the, the Christmas Eve masses and then I would come back in and we'd have a, a celebratory drink and then I would sit down and I would eat some of the very burnt sausages and very crispy bacon. And that's what I wanted it to be. The, it, 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 there was something very special about that taste. And it said that the, the Christmas Eve masses were safely gathered in and I could sit down now and have a gin and tonic with my mum and dad and I would have these very burnt sausages and very crispy bacon. And I would love to watch the opening of the Muppet Christmas Carol because the Muppets have always made me laugh from when I was little. And invariably, I would fall asleep about 15 minutes into watching the film. And then my mum would say, come on, it's time, time to get to bed. You've got more to do tomorrow. But there was, there was something about um, that. So when I cook the turkey now, and in the last parish, they, they were lovely. The, the first year after my mum had died, so it was the first year that I was on my own for Christmas. And there'll be some of you listening to this who were on your own for the first time this Christmas because of something that's happened. And I think that's hard at the best of times and so much harder um, at this time of year, I was saying to my sister uh, last night, because my, my dad was poorly all over Christmas and died just into New Year, but we got a chance to see him every day. And we got a chance to go to Nazareth House and be with him. And there'll be people this year, it could well be you, who have somebody that they love very much and they want to be with and they can't be with. Or it could be that you're on your own because somebody has died. And this is the first Christmas that you have to find your way through. And I think, well, it is a case of just trying to get through it um, and, and doing the best that we can. So the first Christmas, my mum um, paid for us all, before she died, she, she paid for us all to go and have Christmas dinner. Um, at a place that she used to like to go to by the canal uh, in Fulridge when, when they would come over and visit. So we did that that year, which was special and poignant. And then the year after, we, uh, the, the parishioners bought me a Mary Berry cookbook. <laughs> uh, it was so kind of them. And I've just got the Mary Berry cookbook out again. And I'm not one who normally follows recipes, but when it comes to turkey, um, I want to get it right for the family because, you know, otherwise we don't go to Christmas dinner. So I, um, so I, I make sure that I, I, I do uh, follow, the, follow the directions in the book and there's, there's post-it notes in there to help me do it. And I'll make sure that there will be sausage and bacon on the turkey and so that it cooks. So you can be pretty sure that all being well, whatever will be happening after I'll be doing, I've done night prayer on Christmas Eve, I'll be sat here and I'll be having uh, those sausages and those bacon, because it's a real, it's a real taste of Christmas. The other year I went round to my sister's and she cooked the turkey and so I'm like, well, I still love that smell of a turkey cooking around Christmas. There are certain smells, aren't there, that take us to different places. And Dolly Parton had a wonderful line that said, we said lots of wonderful lines. But she said, what I wouldn't give to have a taste of my gram of my mum's apple pie. You know, and that's something that things that we can't have now, but sometimes smells can remind us of them. So I decided when I was going to my sister's, 
um, I would uh, I would still cook a turkey because we were having a Christmas dinner down at St Joseph's um, for people and uh, I was really pleased with the way the turkey looked. I managed to brown it off, everything like that. And it was a full turkey rather than a turkey crown. Then I took it out of the oven and then the legs fell off. And the legs fell off and I kept trying to stick the legs back on because I was all excited about taking this down to St Joseph's. But anyway, it worked. So if you're having turkey today, I hope that you're uh, enjoying your turkey. Um, I think we're having soup for starters this year because to keep it simple we used to always have melon when I was when I was little um, we, we had lots of like all have lots of family traditions and I, you know when I, when I grew up I grew up in Rottenstall and somebody from one of our parishioners was telling me last week he'd been back over to Rottenstall and someone was reminding him about my dad and my dad was a sub postmaster. We moved there when I was about six. And um, in fact, just before Christmas, uh, and we didn't have to go to school for the last week of term, which I thought was brilliant at the time, because um, we got to play more. And he was a sub postmaster. And my mum, once I was 11, trained to be a teacher. Because she'd set off training to be a teacher when she was 18. Then my grandma was ill. So she went home to look after my grandma and granddad. So we, we, we would be there and um, my grandma, because we come from Castleton near Rochdale, uh, St Gabriel's Parish. It was lovely the other week. We were actually praying for St Gabriel's Parish. So um, we would go. Uh, so we went from there. My grandma moved over across the road. And you see, my grandma would let me get away with anything. And um, I show my mum and dad knew as well. So if I wasn't allowed to do something at home, then I would go over to my grandma's. And I would say, Grandma, please, can I? And she'd say, of course you can, love. And there were all sorts of things that I'd watch on Blue Peter and then go over and try and do at my grandma's. And sometimes I would nearly blow up her flat in the sheltered accommodation because I'd seen something that involved newspaper and flour and water and putting it in the oven to make a wonderful Father Christmas. Never quite managed to do it like the one they prepared earlier. And the other thing is she would always let me decorate her flat and it, it was at the time, I haven't seen it as much these days, but there used to be fake snow in the fake snow that you could uh, spray on the windows and things like that. And you used to get a stencil. And my mum and dad said, do not go over to your grandma's and decorate too soon. It's only November. And they go, yeah, I won't do. I won't do. I won't do. I promise I won't do. And then I'd be over there. I said, grandma, you know, it's November 15th. And she'd say, yes, love. I'd say, isn't it time that we decorated your flat? And she'd say, oh, yes, go on, love, if you want. So, and I used to absolutely go crazy with tinsel and with baubles and everything. She could hardly move in the flat by the time I finished. And what I used to do was I used to spray the snow all over her window. And I didn't realise, but that turned it into target practice for the youngsters because they used to throw snowballs thinking that was a target practice. And even on the mirror that she had to get ready in the morning, then I would spray all these different figures over the mirror. So she could never see to, in the mirror to get ready. But she, she would always let me. Um, she'd always let me go over and do that. And then we'd have the Radio Times. And the Christmas and New Year Radio Times would come out. And I would sit down with her and I would try and find as many things. You know, do you remember when you were little? It's so exciting. It's hard to remember, believe now, isn't it? That just didn't think that Christmas Day would ever come. It was just so exciting. And um, I would sit down and mark different programmes that were on TV on the day before 
Christmas Eve and say, well, I could watch that and then I would do that. And, that, and I could, that could get me through. And it was finding all the different things because, of course, there was no, no videos, no DVDs. And that was always a big bone of contention on Christmas Day because uh, all I wanted to do was to play with my toys um, and then we would go, we would say, well, no, come on now, you've got, we've got to go off and see all of our relatives. So, uh, I mean, these days, you've got DVDs uh, and online stuff, but uh, you know, probably a lot of you remember itself, if Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory was on at five o'clock, didn't matter because we'd be out visiting family. But we were always told that that was what Christmas was about and not to pull your face when you got kissed to death by one of your aunties, because they were very happy to see you. And we loved them very much, but we did used to get kissed to death quite a lot when it was over Christmas. So Christmas, when we were little, we would always go on a Christmas Eve afternoon walk. My dad would close the sub post office at lunchtime. And very strange really, well, we thought it was normal, but you grew up in um, a shop. So the front room was, um, wasn't a front room, it was a post office. So uh, my dad would would be there um, all day, every day. And if you went, you could hear people coming in to get the pensions and to send parcels. And, and I never realised that you actually had to pay for a stamp until I went away to university because I would just give, just give the letters to my dad and said, Dad, can you post them? And we had a dog uh, called Jinty. There was a little Scotty dog, lovely little dog. And um, I chose Jinty when we went to the kennels. And apparently that cost my mum and dad a fortune because she was poorly and needed lots of uh, help from the vets. But I felt sorry for her because she looked a bit sad and on the wall. And Jinty was a big celebrity in the shop. So people would come in and be talking to the dog. And, and, and I was always tempted to hide under the counter and start talking back and pretending to be the dog. And they would feed the dog lots of chocolates. You see, and my dad would, would be a bit gentle, say, oh yeah, yeah. And then my mum would say, the dog's got fat again. And she'd say, you'll have to tell everybody that the dog's on a diet. <laughs> so, um, and we used to, there the, the, was a lovely little dog and apparently used to always know when I was coming home from school, even though I'd go get off the bus across the road, a good few minutes walk away, suddenly her ears would prick up and they could always tell that I was coming home. It's strange, isn't it, the way dogs know these things. So Christmas Eve, my dad would close at about half past 12. We would have been sent down and my big brother and my big sister and we had certain jobs that we had to do. Well, I think for me, it was just anything to keep me busy, really, because I was the youngest. And so I usually had to go with my brother and we will go down to Manning's and we will pick up all the different party pies and trifles. And I can remember the trays, these wooden trays, so exciting on Christmas Eve to go down and pick all these things up for the party we'd have the next day. And then as you got bigger, then you'd go with your brother down to Asda. Um, and uh, that was that was always very busy. But we used to, used to still try and go and do shopping on uh, Christmas Eve because, well, there was no click and collect and no delivery. So we'd, we'd have those sorts of, of jobs to do. And then my dad, would take us on a special Christmas Eve walk in the afternoon. And it really was a very special walk. And it would be my sister and I, my brother would be too big to go on them. I don't know what he was doing. But um, we would go walk and we'd take the dog walking and we would go up to Cribden. And Cribden was near Rosendale Ski Slope. And we had the same walk that we will go on every year. And it was very, very magical. Um, and, uh, you know, it was just, you know, it was like the day weather's been today. And, that, and, you know, winter's day, getting dark as we were coming down. We're very excited. And, uh, of course, we didn't realise at all that that gave my mum 
uh, the opportunity to get everything sorted for Christmas. <laughs> so it was, it was a walk just to get us out the way, really. Um, but we did it, and and it was lovely. And then we would wait. Well, supposedly would try and have a sleep, trying to have a sleep on Christmas Eve in the late afternoon was impossible. But the reason for that was because we would, it was midnight mass and it was at midnight and it would be over at St. James the Less. And we were allowed to stay up, even from when I was six, we would go to midnight mass. And I can remember before I served on the altar, I can remember being up in the choir loft and thinking, Oh, this is taking so long. Will this never end? Can we ever get back to see if Father Christmas has been? And whenever I hear, go tell it on the mountain, um, it takes me right back to being little and up in the choir loft and everybody packed in, so full, a midnight mass. So we would supposedly have a sleep in the afternoon, but um, well, as you can imagine, that wasn't really going to be very successful. But we'd try and get through the evening and get to midnight mass and when I was old enough then I and my brother because we didn't have girl altar service at the time otherwise I'm sure my sister would have served on the altar as well we would serve on the altar and that was we wore cassocks and cotters um, I know they wear albs in a lot of places like they do here now but we wore cassocks and cotters and we had red red cassocks and white cotters and they would all have to be washed and starched and so we would move cloud we move round and this is and the the priest at the time was um father hamer was well he was strict i think that'd be fair to say and um very old-fashioned i'm sure he had a heart of gold in there somewhere and i'm sure he did but he used to terrify us and one time we were all stood in the sacristy and we'd been given a, a lit candle each, which on reflection was a bit risky. I don't think we'd do that through risk assessment these days, but we did it. And uh, we were all stood there with a lit candle and then somebody accidentally set somebody else on fire. So the cotter just went up and, and you know, when you're little, uh, or your children and something goes wrong you think let's try and cover it up so we managed to put out this altar server right <laughs> and we were trying to pretend that nothing had happened even though there was smoke everywhere in the sacristy and we, we for some reason we thought that he wouldn't notice that one of the one of the altar servers had been on fire and pretty much the fire damage would have shown on the cotter as well. I can't actually remember how that one finished, but we, we, we carried on. Uh, we carried on. When I was first served on the altar, I used to feel sick when I was on the altar. So I never managed to make it through a full mass. Uh, and then I found a photo the other day and um, they said, oh, there's a wedding. And Jess, Jessie, the housekeeper, she was lovely. And she said to my mum and dad, she wants to come over to the post office and said to my mum and dad, um, Christopher, because he used to call me Christopher, Christopher might be able to uh, serve on this wedding because um, it's only a very short wedding. And if you look at the picture of me on that, I still look quite pale. And I think it only had to be on the altar for about 20 minutes. So uh, a long journey from there to celebrating the Easter vigil. Um, but we used to we used to serve on uh, on Christmas Eve, and then whether whether we'd served on or we're too little to serve on, then we would go back. And it's the only time. Maybe it was the same for you. It's the only time that when I was little that I would see the house in darkness. Um, you know, so there was something very special about coming back in to the house and we used to come in the back gate and down the backyard and there was that agonizing moment to see where the father christmas had been or not i'm sure we would we would leave some sherry and mince pies out for him um and there would be that moment and then the light will go on and then there will be the piles of presents 
my mum and dad worked so hard, well, they worked so hard, but they worked so hard to make sure that we all had the same amount. There would never be a question, even if we were out there with our calculators double checking because we were children, everybody had the same amount as a treat. But when I was little, I didn't understand because what used to happen, um, must have been in before the post office, because we would have the stocking and then, it, yeah, it must have been in the house before because then we went into another room where the big presents were. And, and I, when I was very little, I didn't realise this. So they had the stocking and we had a, a, my brother's football stocking, the old nylon football stocking. Well, one of those, we hung one of those up each. And so it was full and that would have little presents in it. So I, I thought this was wonderful. And I was taking my time every little thing that I got out of that stocking I was wanting to play with it and my brother and sister who were older and they knew the drill they knew the deal this was the this was the start of the main course was next door so they would like merrily just empty the stocking and then be want to get in to see what the main presents were so I was driving them daft by taking my time over every little present needless to say uh, I certainly soon learnt the drill and then you know realised that there would be a bigger present but by the time we moved to Burnley Road to the post office in Rottenstall they would all be in the living room and such a, a wonderful moment as you would go in because then you know at this time of year I used to just love and I still do I'm looking now at, at the Christmas tree um, and I, I love to have gentle Christmas lights and to sit with the fire on and, and be reading a book or listening to some music or maybe watching something on telly but there's that lovely lovely warm feeling when you've just got the Christmas lights on and our Christmas lights are very special because when we moved to Burnley Road which I think was in 1974 73 to 74 it was around then um, we had a set of Christmas lights and my brother who would have been, well, if it was 74, he's what, he's, I'm, he's six years older than me. He must've been about 12. Yeah, he was born in 62, so 12 or 13. And somehow he stood on the, on the fairy lights. <laughs> so needless to say, he was not very popular. And, um, my mum and dad, and they will have just spent everything moving house and everything like that. So money wouldn't have been, would have been tight. Uh, but they knew that we, we wouldn't, we, we, we have Christmas lights. So we were sent down to Woolworths. And the box I still found this year. I think the lights were about £2.27, pence, which is quite a lot in, in, in the early 70s. And they're like little lantern lights and they're still working and I'm looking at them now. So they are, you know, they're, well, they're nearly as old as me, they're about 46 years, yeah, 46 years old, I'm 52. So yeah, they're about 46 years old. And every year there comes a moment when I plug those lights in and I think, hmm. Are they going to work this year? And they do. They have done so far. And I'm relieved. Because I'm looking at them now and I'm thinking, how many stories, how many family stories have those lights seen? Really special Christmases with my grandma and my auntie Margaret. And we used to have a lady come called Mrs. Kelso. Mrs. Kelso, we didn't understand at the time. Mrs. Kelso was, um, who lived, lived in the area. And um, my dad would get to know everybody in the post office as a sub postmaster does. And he realized that she had nowhere to go at Christmas. So every year 
this lady would just appear and be made very much part of our Christmas celebrations. And when you're little, you don't really know who's who, apart from immediate family and, you know. Um, but, but yeah, that was, that was what, what we did, you know. And so she was, she was part of the Christmas every year. And I look at these lights and, you know, I remember my grandma and my auntie Margaret would come over from Castleton. We had a lovely picture of my, my, my auntie Margaret was a, a, a wonderful character. It was my auntie Mary and my auntie Margaret. They were my granddad's sisters. Um, and they used to live on the same street and he, they used to keep an eye on him. And he used to sort of sneak down the back street because he knew they'd be looking out the front to see what he was up to. Because uh, after he nearly set his house on fire with a chip pan. Um, and he was a great character, my granddad. He was an engineer. And when I was little, he'd say, hey, Paul, let me see if I can find you something to play with. And he'd give me all these precision tools that I would end up breaking. Uh, and he was, he was magical. But he died when I was only little. Um, I didn't know... And I didn't know my grandma on that side or my granddad on the other side. So I knew him a little bit. And my granddad Johnson, he was great. It was, it was very funny, the family, one of the favourite family stories about him was when uh, Paul the Sixth, when the Paul the Sixth became Pope, he said, well, I don't like the cut of his jib. Uh, don't, in other words, he didn't like it the way he looked. And then everyone kept saying to him, hey, Jim, you look like that new Pope. <laughs> he, was, he was a lovely character. And my auntie Margaret, looked after my Auntie Mary. My Auntie Margaret never married because she looked after my Auntie Mary who had bad health. And there are many unsung heroes, aren't there, in the world who live a life of generosity and self-giving in ways that people don't know and don't realise. And yet, I think that's what made my Auntie Margaret such a charismatic character that she had made such a selfless choice. I'm sure she would have wanted to be married and could have been married and that. But there was something special about her. And there was something fun about her. She taught us how to play, play cards and gamble and play Newmarket for a penny and two pence pieces. And when I was a university student coming, she would give me 10 pounds and that was a lot of money. You know, and say, love, you go and have a good, good, I'll go see you on a Friday. Go out tonight, love, have a good time. Have some drinks on me. And uh, she had a wonderful sense of humour. Wonderful sense of humour. Uh, we used to have uh, family masses over at hers with a priest called Father Jim Conway, who was at Thornley. And I remember one time we had a family mass and... Uh, she, my cousin had been to Switzerland and bought her a small cowbell. So when it came to the consecration, I had to ring the cowbell. And nobody seemed to think that was strange. And then we'd all, we'd all have brought a buffet over from Manning's, because that was what you did. Well, that was it. That was a special treat with trifles and sausage. I'm getting hungry thinking about them, actually. And one time, double glazing chap knocked on the door. Uh, and said, oh, well, we're just having mass, actually, but you can come in if you want. He said, well, I will, I'm a Catholic. And he came in and he sat down and he joined us for mass and he stayed for the buffet afterwards. I think she didn't get a double glazing, but she was that sort of person. And she would always come over for Christmas. In fact, I remember one in, uh, when she was poorly and it, she lived in the same house all her life. And she didn't want to move. When my grandma moved over to Nilos to sheltered accommodation, we, my auntie didn't want to. Uh, she wanted to stay in the same house. And the only sadness about that was in the last little bit, she had to go into the nursing home nearby, which my grandma didn't have to do. And, and, and just one time, I remember my mum getting upset when she said this. She said, do, do I be on my own at Christmas? And my mum said, no, auntie, you, you're never on your own at Christmas. You come to us. Um, and she did. She would come every year. And we had a very funny photo of her because everything had to stop on Christmas Day for the Queen's speech. And we would have 
we would have had the crackers, we would have had the jokes, we would have had the party hats on, and we had a picture. Uh, I got a Polaroid camera for Christmas. I remember I was very proud of it. And um, you had to get flash cubes. Some might, some of you might remember that. So you put them in the top of the camera and you would, so each time you took with a flash, you had four for the bulb, you know. So, and of course, you're not like cameras now, is it? You're not on the phone. And the idea was seeing what the picture looked like. You had to wait until you took it down to the chemist and get it developed. So I took a picture. I took a picture of my auntie watching the Queen on TV doing the speech. So you had the Queen on TV and my auntie sat with a paper crown on and it was like Queen of the family is watching the head of the Commonwealth here. Um, and that was that was always nice that we would we would do that. So we would we would come back Christmas Eve. Uh, this is just a Christmas ramble, by the way, and uh, to help you enjoy your Christmas dinner. Um, if you're on your main course now, I hope you're enjoying it. If you're all ready at the Christmas pudding, um, then uh, I hope you're enjoying that. Or if you're just listening to this, well, I hope it's helping a little bit, just to just to hear a few Christmassy stories and reminisces. So we would. We'll get back on Christmas Eve and um, we will be allowed to stay up then till about oh, three o'clock in the morning. And I think my mum and dad thought we would just let them play with their presents for a bit and then they get some sleep. My poor mum and dad must have been absolutely exhausted, but I can remember that we will get back from midnight mass at about oh half past one two o'clock and then we open some of the presents so we had a chance to play for a bit and then then somehow they managed to get us to bed um i think otherwise we would have been waking them up at four in the morning anyway so then we will get up on christmas day and christmas going to church in our family was very ordinary extraordinary but ordinary I hope you know what I mean by that by that I mean that's what we did as a family that always came first um, and on Christmas Day then usually my brother and I would go over and serve on the Christmas Day Mass as well uh, and my grandma would always sit as looking out from the altar to the sanctuary she would sit on the right hand side the second bench back at the end she always would sit there. And if I ever got the chance to do the throwable, I mean, this is crazy. I used to like to waft the incense towards her because I thought she'd like the smell of the incense. The fact that she was asthmatic and it used to make her cough, I maybe should have given some more thought about. But again, my grandma would say, hey, don't worry, love. Don't worry, love. I'll be all right. I thought she'd like the smell of the incense, really. But then I was only still quite young uh, and daft. So we will go, uh, we will go and celebrate, uh, we have mass and then um, we would have our Christmas dinner um, and then, then there will be a bit of a time when we might get to play a bit. Then for a time we used to go back over to Castleton and Rochdale and we used to go over old bets. And the way that they used to keep us busy was counting Christmas trees, which was fine going through Edenfield, but there are no Christmas trees over old bets. It's up on the moors. And I think if you got on the left hand side of the car, you, you always did better than the right hand side of the car. We'd worked it out after a bit. <laughs> and we used to sit in the back, my brother and sister and I, and I, because I was the youngest, I had to sit in the middle. And we'd merrily be kicking each other's shins all the way there and back. All the way there and back. And we're like, Are you kicking each other? No, no. And we'd be prodding each other and kicking each other all the way there and back. Supposedly counting Christmas tree. And of course, I mean, it was great because we go, um, we used to go to, we, we went to uh, my, my grandma's sister's, so that was Auntie Alice. Trying, you know, when you're little and you don't really, work out who's who. And then there was Auntie, no, Auntie Mary trainer was my grandma's, and then there was Auntie Alice trainer. 
Now, Auntie Alice trainer was related, but for some reason, my brother, when he was little, called her Uncle Harry. So everybody in the family thought it was hilarious. Instead of calling her Auntie Alice, they called her Uncle Harry. And then I looked and I thought, why are they calling her Uncle Harry? And I used to get a bit confused about that. But I was little, so, you know, as long as, as, long as we got the toys. Um, and so we would go over. Um, and then, of course, it'd be like, you know, do not ask where your present is. Don't just go in and say, have you got me a present? Um, and be prepared to be kissed to death uh, on the chance that you will get a present. And then as we got a bit older, what used to happen is that my mum's older brother, my brother, my mum, my dad was an only child. So we would go to, uh, on Boxing Day, we would go to my Auntie Phoebe's, who was his cousin's mum. And... It was, a, it was a big old house with enormous cupboards in the kitchen. And it was lovely. And she was lovely. But she served blancmange. And oh, I still can't look at blancmange today. And that is where my dad, who was a very quiet man, he went out to get something from the car. And he, he came, well, he didn't come back in. That was the point. We were at a family Christmas gathering. You know when everybody sat round and, as Peter Kay would say, all the emergency chairs are out. And we were all sat round in the living room. And after a bit, somebody said, where's, where's, where's Brian? Where's your dad? I don't know, really. And then he came back in. I said, where have you been? He said, well, he said, I got the stuff from the car. And then I didn't really pay attention. And I went and sat in next door's house. And he, he went in, this is brilliant, it was me. he went in, he sat down, and it was about 20 minutes before they noticed that he wasn't from their family. And what's more worrying is it was about 20 minutes before he realised that, that he was in the wrong house. And that happened to my auntie, my auntie, my auntie Marie, so my, my, my mum's twin brother, her his wife, Auntie Marie, lovely, lovely lady, a, a bit like Hyacinth Bucket, not really like that, in a, in a, but a bit, like to be a bit posh, you know, um, and uh, it, she was, her, she lived near my Auntie Fee when they grew up with Mr and Mrs Banks, Mr Banks was like Mr Sheen, uh, and if he wanted to change a conversation, he just, he wouldn't apologise, Scott, switching and talk about something else. Um, but she once was coming out of a shop and my cousin and my uncle <laughs> were sat in the car and she start, She got in the wrong car, but she, she got in the wrong car and was clearly giving out about something. And my uncle and my cousin just fell about laughing. And then when she got in the right car, they, they couldn't stop laughing, so they were in trouble. So it seems a bit of a family trait, ending up going in the wrong place. But, so we will go... Uh, over there uh, to Castleton um, but when we got a bit older my my old my my mum's older brother my uncle Tony who was the head teacher at uh, Holy Family on Kirkholt, uh he would come over with my auntie Midge and with all the family now at one time they had a reliant robin and they realised, the reason why they had a reliant Robin was that my auntie, if I get this right, didn't have a driving licence. But you could drive a reliant Robin with a motorbike licence, which she did have. And they would, there were five, hang on, there was Katie, uh, Colin, Kirsten, Simon. There were four of them, plus there were six, all in this uh, reliant Robin. And uh, so they would come over later on Christmas Day. And then we would play party games. Now, my dad didn't like playing party games, especially if it involved drawing. Because like me, drawing freehand was not his strong point. So what he used to do is he would go and do the washing up in the kitchen. And I could see him now, he would be in the kitchen washing up and he would have a cigar <laughs> and a drink 
And he didn't drink, actually, Dad. I can think of it, he probably didn't even have a drink on Christmas Day. He only ever said, he only really did only have one too much to drink once. And that's because he didn't realise that lager top was lager with a little bit of shandy and he thought it was, or oh, was it la, la, uh, lager and lime? Anyway, he thought it was a shandy and it wasn't. So he, he wasn't a drinker. But he would, he would go into the kitchen and we would offer to help. Say, Dad, do you want help with the washing up? And go, no, 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 I'm fine. And he would, uh, he would, if it was Christmas Day, there'd be no football on. Any other time when over Christmas, if there was football on, he'd have the radio on as well. And he used to just take his time. And I think that was his sanity break from us. The last thing he wanted was any of us in the kitchen. And anyway, there was no point doing, if we did washing up in our house, which we all had to do, what would happen is if I was washing up and my brother or sister were drying, then they must have put back in about 50% of everything I washed. Now, their defence would be that I hadn't washed it properly and it needed washing properly. But I have a sneaking suspicion that there were a number of times when they just kept putting it back in just to wind me up. But that's brothers and sisters and the love that we have. Um, so my cousins would come over and we would play party games and uh, we would do all sorts of 20 questions and um, we would do uh, miming all different things, pantomime ones and give us a clue and all of those. And we, we, we used, to, used to go past the parcel. Who did pass the parcel? Um, and then, uh, but you see, the thing is, um, when we were little, my cousins, um, well, we, we used to say that Father Christmas hadn't arrived because there was always a risk that they might break one of your new toys. So they would come over and they'd say, oh, Father Christmas. And they'd say, what's Father Christmas brought you? And we'd go, um, don't know yet. He doesn't arrive until Christmas night in Rottenstall. And they go, all right. I said, no, no, doesn't arrive. What we've done is we put all our Christmas presents upstairs safely out the way. And then what would happen is that my mum and dad would have bought them Christmas presents, right? Now, one year, and I still get in trouble for remembering this and the look on my face, because my mum and dad used to, they used to get really, really good presents, like, I don't know, Airfix models, and oh, toys are great, and stuff. And, and, you know, it just depended on the year with my Uncle Tony and Auntie Midge. And one year, between the entire family, they bought a cheese dome. And I think I was about 12 at the time. And I thought, right, we're quids in now. Christmas present. Here we go. Here we go. I want a cheese dome between all of us. And apparently I got in trouble because of the look on my face. Uh, and my sister and brother still laugh that um, 40 years later I can say, of course, these days, cheese dome would be a wonderful gift. So perhaps they were just very forward looking in what would have made a great present. But then we would, we would have, uh, so we would play the party games and then they would go about 10 or half past 10 and then we would clear up. And every year my sister would fall asleep on the settee. Uh, she'd have half a glass of wine and then she'd fall asleep on the settee. And people would literally be hoovering up around her. And every year she would say, I didn't fall asleep. So the year that I was bought a camera for Christmas gave me the perfect opportunity to get photographic evidence of my sister fast asleep when we were busy tidying up. So I proved it anyway. Um, and then we would watch, uh, once videos came in, uh, once a video recorder would come in, then we would watch um, Only Fools and Horses. There'd be a Christmas special on. And we would sit down and watch Only Fools and Horses or something. And then Boxing Day, Boxing Day was always a time uh, to play with your toys. If it was a bike, you could get out on your bike. Uh, I used to love Boxing Day. 
And as we got, um, as I've grown up, and then with nieces and nephews, what became a great tradition of Boxing Day, and isn't it funny how things go around and come around, we will come to Bolton, uh, never imagining that I would end up living here and being very happy here in this parish. We came to Bolton, and we uh, will go to the pantomime at Bolton. And uh, many of you will know that for many years it was Stu Francis saying, oh, I could crush a grape. And uh, we went with my, from when my eldest niece was little, and she's 30 now. Um, so that was uh, all the way then to Ben, Jack and Dion. When they were very, the first year um, we took them to a pantomime was the Snow Queen over in Bury. And Ben was frightened. So I had to sit in the foyer with him. And I had to do an entire pantomime on my own to try and keep him entertained. And then I just about persuaded him to go back in. And when I went back in, uh, then the Snow Queen appeared on stage and he burst into tears. So thank you very much, Snow Queen, for that one. So we will go to the pantomime uh, in Bolton. We'd also go to the pantomime over in Cone. Um, and uh, called municipal halls and it was funny when my younger nephews were little um i would i was sat with them and then some of the children from the parish came over and you could clearly see that my nephew's body language was said not tonight this is uncle night and you can't be with him tonight because he's our uncle so they used to have to try and say said, no no you can share and then the last time we took them to the pantomime Oh, was it last year or the year before? And then said, oh, we've heard all the jokes because of teenagers. I said, yes, but the funny thing is, you know the jokes are going to happen. You know they're going to do the 12 days of Christmas. You know they're going to do the behind you and we'll have to sing it again one. I said, and anyway, we sat through it all with you as well. So very happy memories of driving over to Bolton um, and I can remember one year driving over, my mum was, was poorly that year. Um, so I b came over with my dad and with Rini, and she lived next door to my gran in the sheltered accommodation. And pretty much by the end, she would tell everybody that I was her grandma and it was just easier to say yes. And um, I remember she came with us to the pantomime. My mum my mom was poorly and so, and then she was poorly. It was a year where there was, oh, there was lots of people were poorly that year. And that can happen some Christmases, can't it? Where it just seems everything's going on. And um, and then she she was in hospital then, uh, and she died not long after. And I remember her saying, "Well, I've had my time, love. There needs to be space now for the little babies on the earth." And she was she was a lovely lady. Uh, she used to say, "E, look at that hair, all burn coloured." Wasted on a boy. And she used to ruffle my hair. And I used to let her get away with it. But, so you have all these. All these memories. Of, that come flooding out at Christmas. Don't they? Of, of Christmases that were happy. Christmases that were difficult. I'm sure when I look at our Christmas lights. I think that. There was probably always one of us. As we were growing up. That was a worry to my mum and dad. I know I was a number of times, and I'm sure my brother and sister. And so they, 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 all these lights remember all those times. And I look at the baubles on the tree, and we've got, there's a Christmas pudding on there. That's because I used to call my nephew's Christmas puddings. And so my mum made three baubles that looked like Christmas puddings. And there's one very old bauble left, because I used to get in trouble for spinning the baubles when I was little and break, break most of them. One of them survived. And then there's two baubles on the tree that I bought. Bought the first one the year after my dad died. And that's on the tree. I bought that with my mum when we were in Rome. And then after my mum died, I bought another bauble uh, that's on the tree to remember her. So they're special. As is the nativity scene. And we're, our nativity scene is quite... A childlike one. And my dad didn't really like it because he didn't. 
I think he, he liked things much more traditional. And uh, he especially didn't like that we used to change who it was each year for St Joseph. And we used to say, oh, Dad, we're having auditions. We think we might put this younger one this year. And he used to, we, he used to get exasperated with us. But uh, that crib's been with us a long time. These decorations and things, they all, they all remind us, don't they, of, of Christmas's past. And, you know, the good memories for those can't be taken away from us. If you're feeling at the moment, well, that, that, they were great, but where are they now? They're inside us. And I think in prayer, using our memory, we can touch into, we can touch into those lovely stories from the past and bring them to life in God's presence. Maybe sit and look into the fire or into the Christmas lights and let some lovely ghosts of Christmas past come back to be with you. And yes, there'll be some Christmases that will come that will, will bring a tear. There'll be some that will look back and think, I don't know how on earth we got through that Christmas. And you know, perhaps that's a really important message for this Christmas. Sometimes people say, oh, give something six months and see what it's like then. If, you, if I'm to think back over some Christmases where I was on my life journey and faith journey or other people in the family or with illnesses or... I don't know how we got through some Christmases. But we did. Well, I do know how we got through. Faith was central. Emmanuel, God with us. That was the abiding message. And that helped us. And under these present circumstances, 2020, with oh, everything going on, changing by the day, somebody asked me how I was today. I said, I'm fine as long as I don't try and make any plans because I don't know how to make plans at the moment. Perhaps it's, if we look back and we think, I don't know how I got through that. Maybe that will help us get through this Christmas a realisation that Emmanuel, God with us, we can get through this Christmas. And if you're thinking, well, what on earth will the year be ahead? Where, where will we be next Christmas by the time we're putting up the decorations or all being well? Because we, nobody knows what the next day will bring. But then it's a time for us to give everything to God. I look at the moment at all the beautiful cards that people have bought me and I am spoiled. People take great care and effort in the Christmas cards that they choose me. All wonderful scenes that speak of God's love made visible in Jesus Christ. And that's where I want to finish. I hope that is, this, is, this has helped you have your Christmas dinner. If you've had your Christmas dinner on your own, or I hope it's helped you if you sat with your feet up at home at the end of Christmas Day. Or I hope it's helped you if you're just trying to get to sleep. Because, as I said at the beginning, this is a message of love. This is to say you're not on your own. This is to say that this is a special time, a gift from God. Emmanuel God is with us. So I'd like to finish with a short prayer. Lord, for all the special memories that you give us of Christmas's past, we thank you. For all those Christmases that were difficult that you helped us through, we thank you. For the true message of this Christmas in these strange and difficult times that you are with us. Lord, we truly thank you. And we ask for your blessing now on ourselves, on all those who we love and all those who need our prayers.
And may Almighty God bless you and guide you and keep you safe. And may you always know the love and the peace of Christ. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Goodbye, God bless and happy Christmas.